My name is Michael Laffen. I've been a lecturer, then an associate professor in UCD in the department, now the School of History, or History and Archives, for very many years, for over 30 years. And in almost all that time, almost every year, I've given a course or a module called the Irish Revolution. This is a sort of introduction to 10 lectures that I gave in my final year on the UCD staff before I retired. For many years I'd done research on the Irish Revolution and giving the course seemed a natural way of first of all making sure that I, I kept fresh in the subject, that's a selfish approach, but also that I would be able to give the students the benefit of, of work that I was actually doing at the time. I took time off the course, I did other things, but the Irish Revolution was understandably a popular course, not because of me, but because of its, its nature, because of the subject matter. So uh, it interacted with research I was doing for, first of all, a book on the partition of Ireland, and then for another book on the Sinn Féin party between 1916 and 1923. And on some days of the week when I wouldn't be teaching in UCD, I would be in the National Library, National Archives, or somewhere else uh, doing research. So the course the lectures that I gave uh, and the work that I did in writing my books and articles fed on each other and interacted with each other. The course is about a major upheaval in Irish political life, uh, about the way in which a natural or what seems to be a natural tendency or direction or trajectory was stopped in its tracks. The trajectory towards home rule within the United Kingdom, which seemed the obvious development for Ireland in the early years uh, of the second decade of the 20th century, from 1910 onwards. That was blocked by the Ulster opposition to home rule, by the consequent militarisation of Irish society, and the opportunities that these developments gave to a small radical group to stage a rebellion and hijack a nationalist movement, a moderate nationalist movement, and shift it in a different, more radical direction. With the result that by 1922, uh, most of Ireland, the 26 counties of the Free State, uh, were ruled by people who uh, could not have imagined themselves being in any position of power or authority 10, 15 years earlier. Uh, a political revolution, to an extent a military revolution, not in most ways a social revolution because, and I mentioned this in one of my early lectures, because the Irish social revolution was over before the political revolution or the military revolution began. And the Irish social revolution was effectively the land acts from 1870, from the 1880s onwards. These acts carried out, implemented by British governments, largely conservative governments, transferred ownership of most of the land of Ireland to what had been tenant farmers, who now became small landowners. It was a social revolution, carried out largely peacefully, and it was largely complete before the political and military revolution began. And that is an unusual pattern. In other revolutions like France, of course, or Russia, there would be a powerful, sometimes a dominant social component in the revolution. That wasn't the case in Ireland. What was involved in Ireland was a change of government and a change of relations between most of Ireland and the United Kingdom. Uh, profound significant changes, a revolution in some respects but not in other respects. Some people ask, was there a revolution? Uh, they might follow that up with, is your course, the Irish Revolution, mistitled? And yes, in ways, there was a revolution. Uh, a major change came about as the result of partly political pressure, but also by force, by violence, by the Easter Rising, by the War of Independence between 1919 and 1921. And these major changes brought about uh, not a change in ownership of land or a dramatic change in the balance of wealth between one group and another, but it did bring classes and groups and almost an ideology to power in Ireland that wouldn't have come to power uh, or else wouldn't have come to power nearly as quickly as turned out to be the case. Uh, I mentioned ideology. 
a part of the ideology of the Irish Revolution was the Irish Ireland movement, the idea that Ireland should speak Irish. We know that that hasn't come about. Uh, my course, this interview, uh, the, the, these remarks have been given in English because we are still an English-speaking country, but at least the, the status of the Irish language uh, has changed, and that was an ideological element within the Irish Revolution. But for the most part, what the rebels, the revolutionaries wanted was to drive Britain out, to end British rule, to establish a fully independent Irish state, and that was, in many ways, a revolutionary objective that was, to an almost complete extent, uh, achieved, at least as far as the 26 counties of the Free State, later the Republic, are concerned. One of the, the, the odd features, one of the paradoxes of the Irish Revolution and of the years before it, was that Ireland, most of Ireland, achieved independence largely through violence, not entirely, and yet Ireland remained a democracy. And this is in part because of the inheritance, of the legacy uh, that uh, was uh, handed on that, that, by uh, the Home Rule Party, that was received from the Home Rule Party. Because for decades before the First World War, the Home Rule Party dominated nationalist Ireland. I mean, I've said in one of my lectures that uh, most of Ireland was a one-party nation. Ulster Unionists, of course, dominated another part of the island. But most of Ireland was firmly in the control of the Home Rule Party. Uh, so much so that very often nobody bothered challenging a sitting MP for election. Elections were rather theoretical. Uh, and the Home Rule Party, with its concern with localism, uh, with its uh, clientism, uh, with its habits, uh, permeated Irish public life. Its, its views and its values became adopted by, accepted by, very many Irish people, including many of its enemies. So when it, the Home Rule Party, was displaced by Sinn Féin in the second half of the First World War, most of the people who now, in 1918, voted for Sinn Féin had been Home Rule supporters just a few years earlier, and they brought with them their old habits, their old customs. So, to an extent, despite a change of leadership and despite a change of policy, of ideology, if you like, nonetheless, the new Sinn Féin party was, to a very large extent, comprised of members of or supporters of uh, the old Home Rule Party. So the Home Rule Party was able to transmit to its victorious enemy uh, in the course of 1917 and 1918 um, not only its personnel in the terms of its voters, but also many of its values, which in turn, it could be argued, and I do argue, uh, were transmitted to the successor parties of the United Sinn Féin, Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael. And I, I know it might sound odd and it might be a slight exaggeration to say that they, those parties, are the successors of the Home Rule Party of Parnell and Redmond with the intervention, uh, the, the intervening phase of the United Sinn Féin Party. But there is something to be said for such an interpretation. It could, it could be and can be uh, and is argued. Another paradox in the Irish Revolution was that the inspiration given to the IRB uh, to the IRA, uh, to the rebels between 1916 and 1921, was inspired originally by Sir Edward Carson, uh, conservatives and unionists, whose aim was to maintain unchanged the relationship between Ireland and Britain. They, the, the, the unionists, uh, were one of the very, very few rebellious groups or groups which thought or planned a rebellion who wanted to change nothing, who wanted to maintain things exactly as they were. And yet, even though they were, they could be seen as the deadly enemies of Irish Republicans, they gave an example. They provided a role model to or for uh, Irish Republicans. They made physical force, they made the importation of arms respectable. They made it relevant to the circumstances of 1912, 1916, and so on. And those very, very few Irish nationalists in and outside the IRB that thought in terms of an Irish Republic knew that that could be achieved only by violence. There was no chance of violence ever succeeding. Uh, Irish public opinion wouldn't wear it. Uh, they were uh, a mocked, derided, marginalised minority until suddenly, 
Their deadly enemies, the Unionists, uh, began marching, drilling, later importing arms, giving them an example which they could and did follow. So I claim, with perhaps some exaggeration, perhaps not, uh, I claim that Sir Edward Carson should be honoured as one of the founders of the Irish Republic, that there should be a statue to him, that without him there would have been no Patrick Pierce, no Tom Clark, no Easter Rising, no Free State, probably no Republic of Ireland. In the course, I begin by looking at different groups, home rulers, Ulster Unionists, and so on, but I stress the importance of events in Britain in influencing Irish affairs, particularly before the First World War, though also later. And among those events was a polarised society in Britain. Uh, the, the Liberals had come to power with a massive parliamentary majority in 1906, ending 20 years of Conservative domination. The Conservatives refused to accept that position lying down. They used the House of Lords to block, to sabotage, to undermine measures by the Liberal government until eventually a two-year-long conflict between the two Houses of Parliament, the Commons and the Lords, resulted in the triumph of uh, the, the Commons, the defeat of the Lords. And then the first item the first piece of legislation to be brought in, to be uh, proposed to the House of Commons, to Parliament, uh, under the new legislation, was Home Rule for Ireland, which could now no longer be blocked by uh, the House of Lords, as had been the case on the last occasion in 1893. The result of this, uh, support by the Conservatives of the Ulster Unionists, disaffection in the army, encouragement by uh, the most senior figures in the Conservative Party, including the party leader, the opposition leader, Andrew Bonner Law, two elements in the army to disobey the government. There was an extraordinary pattern by 1914, whereby the British government, in effect, lost control of the army. It couldn't rely on the army to obey orders. And this is illustrated by uh, a point that I make, a quotation that I, I, I provided uh, the students in one of the lectures, uh, a remark by Asquith. After the outbreak of war in Europe, when Austria-Hungary attacked Serbia and it became clear to him and to everyone else that Britain would almost certainly be involved in a European war, Asquith was asked, what's going to happen about Austria-Hungary and Serbia? And he replied nonchalantly, it'll take attention away from Ulster, which is a very good thing, because the one thing worse than a European war for Britain would be a civil war. And Asquith and others were genuinely afraid that the confrontation, the eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball confrontation between nationalists and unionists, conservatives and liberals, over this issue might provoke civil war within the United Kingdom. And the king, George V, was appalled at that prospect, horrified that on his watch, during his reign, there should be a collapse into violence of the sort that Britain hadn't experienced since the 17th century. So, in the history of Britain, as well as of Ireland, the events before the First World War, the Home Rule Crisis of 1912 to 1914, are an extraordinary event, an extraordinary se series or sequence of events. Since I began the course way back in 1976, an enormous number of books and articles have become available, uh, documents have become available, private papers have been released, just to take perhaps the most obvious example, or the two most obvious examples, De Valera's papers are now available. And the files of the Bureau of Military History, interviews with many, many hundreds of people involved in the events of 1913 to 21, these have at long last been made available. We simply have much more evidence than was available back in the mid-1970s. There is a wealth of books and uh, of, 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 of documents and also, of course, matching that or building on that, of interpretations. Just to take one example, there are now several significant, important and valuable local studies. The first of these appeared uh, in the year after I began the course, uh, Fitzpatrick's Politics and Irish Life, a study of County Clare. There are lots of other good books, just to take one or two. There is uh, a book that is now rather dated. Uh, it was published in 1967. William Irwin Thompson's The Imagination of an Insurrection, written not by a historian, but by a literary critic. It is a brilliant and wonderful book. It's hard to get hold of, but anybody who does get hold of it and who reads it finds it endlessly fascinating. Another book that I recommend highly, totally different, 
Thomas Jones's Whitehall Diary. Historians, of course, love historical characters who write diaries or write letters. And Tom Jones was Lloyd George's advisor, his confidential advisor, who played a key role in the treaty negotiations and, fortunately for historians, wrote about it every night. So we have there a series of pen portraits, a series of studies of how decisions are made. So these are two very different books, uh, uh, two uh, that I have chosen, not quite at random, but I could have chosen many others. There is a vast range of books and articles now uh, available to students and to general readers uh, of a sort that really wasn't available until the 1960s or even the 1970s or later. It's not a full or complete history of the Irish Revolution. It wasn't intended to be such, simply because of the way in which the course was organised, the way in which it was structured. Because I gave ten lectures, all of which have been recorded, but also I conducted ten seminars in which we dealt with various topics that I would allude to in passing in the lectures but wouldn't examine in any detail. So the result is there are gaps some important gaps. For example, the conscription crisis of 1918, the role of the Labour Party. We looked in detail at certain important documents like the Solemn League and Covenant of 1912. Uh, we looked at uh, the Easter Week Proclamation, uh, at the Treaty. So these are simply not covered in the course. And because of the way in which I lecture, with one sheet of paper in front of me, so that I'm not distracted by text. I'm not always looking down and reading. I'm looking at my audience, trying to see are they awake, uh, trying to catch them, uh, try, trying to catch their eyes. But for that reason, uh, I speak more or less spontaneously, but sometimes there are repetitions, sometimes there are even, I'm, I'm horrified to admit, there are even some slips. For example, an alert listener might say, surely he meant uh, Lord Hartington, not Harcourt. Yes, I should have said Hartington. Uh, somebody might say, when you go back as far as 1834 and you refer to the change of government when William IV sacked his Prime Minister, surely it was Robert Peel who was summoned from Rome. And the answer is yes, of course it was. Uh, it was Wellington who was in London who acted as Prime Minister. Somebody might say, in 1922, surely common public thought was an anti-treaty, not a pro-treaty party. Yes, quite right. So there are little slips like that. But I don't think that they make any significant difference. And I think that on balance it's very much better for me to have lectured more or less spontaneously, just glancing down at a sheet of paper, then up again and looking at my audience as I'm looking at the camera now. Uh, that is a much better way, for me at least, of lecturing. And the drawbacks, I think, are very small in comparison with the advantages. I've enjoyed teaching the course. Uh, I, I sometimes feel and say that if I didn't enjoy it, the students wouldn't. If I were bored with it, they would certainly be bored. And I remember with a certain affection perhaps uh, a few incidents or characters. Um, I remember in, in one discussion of the treaty, uh, a student overcome with rage and indignation, telling me in fury, I hate Lloyd George. I cannot stand him. So I punished the student in a highly appropriate way, I think. When we had a tutorial discussion on the treaty, and I divided the group into two, you are pro-treaty, you are anti-treaty, uh, I said, and you are Lloyd George. You've got to put yourself into his position. He looked at me with the same hatred, I think, that he had expressed earlier towards Lloyd George, but he did a fairly decent job. Uh, and he was appropriately rewarded by me. I mean, I, I thought that he came out of it very well. I think it's enormously valuable, it's essential, to encourage or force students to put themselves into the minds of characters that they don't identify with, that they might, in this particular case, dislike or hate or resent. Uh, they have to see that there are two or sometimes many sides. And although over the decades I find that students are far less committed now to supporting one or other side over the treaty than was the case in the 1970s, where they would reflect parents' or grandparents' uh, loyalties much more than is the case now. Still, uh, it is useful to force a student who might be pro-treaty to take the anti-treaty side and vice versa. And these, I think, are, are valuable exercises in uh, encouraging students to 
see the world through other people's eyes, an essential part of the study of history uh, of any period, of any country.